Hello and, and welcome to the Center for Teaching and Learning for today's uh, closing presentations, in a sense, of the 2017-2018 round of the Rosencrantz Grants for Pedagogical Advancements. I'm Trip Kirkpatrick, I'm Associate Director for Educational Technology here. And I'll start by thanking uh, Robert Rosencrantz, our funder, without which, uh, uh, whom none of this would be possible. Uh, but also, in all seriousness, for his interest in funding um, the exploration of digital technologies, possibilities uh, for positive and thoughtful, most importantly, thoughtful contributions to teaching and learning. Uh, in our annual call for uh, proposals and selection process, and I'll say something about the grants in just a second, we, we try to look for projects um, that put digital technologies at the service of working out meaningful changes in teaching and learning. Um, the Rosencrantz grants are up to $10,000. We offer them, we've, this will be the third cohort that you'll see today. Um, and the call will open up again in November and we look for things that uh, are making a, an intervention with digital technology uh, in the service of teaching and learning. Um, I'm really looking forward to the proposals today, uh, and you didn't come here to listen to me, so that'll be basically that, except for two logistical points. Um, one is that we're going to have each presentation and then some Q&A after it, um, and then if and as we have time and interest at the end, we'll have some more open discussion. Um, some of our presenters, unfortunately, are going to have to leave before that point, but since part of what we want to do with this is to share the work that's getting done and to see uh, how other people might think of these. If you have a question that can't get answered for one reason or another, contact me, I'll get you in contact with the project people and, and we can get it happen. The other is that we're going to have a short break in the middle. We're going to have three presentations and then a break and then another three. So if you can save whatever reason you would otherwise have to leave until the break, which should be at about one o'clock, then that would be great. Um, so, so in our first cluster, and I'll just do it all now so we can uh, let them go. Um, we're going to hear from, in order, um, Steve Stearns and Madeline Case, right? Okay. Um, from Ecology and Evolutionary Biology on their team's project, Training 21st Century Educators to Explain Science to the World. Uh, and then the next group, Elise Wong, Christopher Tormey, and Alexis Sidden from the School of Medicine Departments of Internal Medicine, Laboratory Medicine, and Pathology with their project on a multidisciplinary, interactive, digital, peripheral smear course for medical students and beyond. Uh, and then for the end of the first cluster, Sarita Suarez and Brian Brown from the School of Medicine's Internal Medicine Primary Care Residency Program talking about sugar-coated science, animating and anthropomorphizing drugs, molecules, and cells to enhance medical trainee diabetes education. Thanks, and we'll get going. Hi, everybody. So I would like to report on uh, a project that was designed to teach graduate students and postdocs how to give short online lectures that would be effective when presented on the World Wide Web. And uh, we had nine people that decided to take part. The idea basically was to train PhD students and postdocs and how to give a clear, compelling, concise online lecture. We also want to showcase the diversity of competent young scientists and thereby provide images of role models for the world. We wanted to provide content that was helpful and appropriate for AP biology courses and for introductory college level biology courses that could be used as resources for teachers. We also wanted our job candidates to be able to put a URL on their CV and say, click here if you want to see me teach. And uh, in addition to that, we wanted to provide a method for our faculty to say, we have satisfied the NIH and NSF outreach requirements because our students are going out and they are not only doing this on the web, they're practicing their talks at high schools. So we got going uh, this year and we had a few setbacks. Uh, basically what we discovered is that our PhD students and postdocs are very busy, <laughs> which will not surprise you. As a result, we have one person, Maddie, who has completed the process with the exception that we have not yet recorded. So basically the money that we got from Rosencrantz is for the professional recording and editing so that when we present ourselves to the world it looks professional. 
We don't need that if we want to walk into that room over there and practice. That's free. Okay, so we're going to do that before we go down to College Street and get into the studio. And these guys will do the usual job that they do on people like me. Okay. So the reason that I, I had this idea is basically that I have recorded two full courses, a total of nearly 90 lectures that are up on the web. And I've been impressed by the impact they've had worldwide. I've been getting emails now for about nine years on those. Um, and I thought that this would be a good way to help our grad students and postdocs uh, get the kind of teaching experience that might be relevant for them 10, 20 years down the road. In, in fact, it's probably relevant tomorrow. So uh, I'll now turn it over to Maddie, and Maddie can tell you how the process worked. Hi, I'm Maddie Case. Um, I'm a fourth-year PhD student in the EEB department and one of the participants in this program this year. Um, and the process that we developed was designed to give us lots of opportunity for feedback and also for giving other people a chance to learn from what we were doing. Um, so each one of us participating in this has developed two paired 15-minute lectures the first on a general topic in ecology or evolutionary biology, and the second on our own research as an example of how actual scientists do that, that kind of work. Um, so most of us started from the point of that second lecture thinking about what is something that I've done that would be exciting that I'd like to share, and then zooming out and seeing what is the larger topic that, that fits uh, that that fits into. So for myself, I work on plant ecology in African savannas, and I designed my second lecture to talk about work that I had done looking at vegetation change in an African savanna. And my first lecture, to put that in context, I talked about um, what determines vegetation around the world and what determines vegetation change. And <sighs> What all of us have, have done with these lectures is first practice them in front of an audience of our peers, which is that in the EEB department every Friday afternoon we have an informal seminar series that we call the Speakeasy, um, where it's usually grad students or postdocs giving talks, and so we use that as a forum to give practice talks and to get feedback from a bunch of other grad students and postdocs. Um, who all have some teaching experience, and could, we could talk to each other about what was working, what wasn't, thinking a lot about how to tailor our talks. Um, when most of us are used to mostly talking to scientific audiences, how do we pitch these to AP biology or early college students? Um, so that was the first round of feedback. And then after doing that, we edit the talks some more and then take them to an audience closer to the target audience, which is an AP biology class at a nearby high school, um, which is also um, in its own right um, a form of outreach, reaching local high school students, showing them what Yale students are doing and how exciting science can be. Um, and it was an incredible way to get feedback. Um, so I did this recently, visiting uh, co-op high school here downtown and got a lot of feedback from them about what was the most exciting in my presentation, um, which will help in doing a final round of edits on these lectures before creating some polished filmed lectures to put online. Um, at every stage, I've been learning about how to make a good lecture, and we've also been uh, doing things that the people watching us can learn from. Ultimately, the final product of this is also going to be something that benefits me as someone who is going to be applying for jobs where having some evidence of my teaching abilities is useful, but will also benefit anyone who can access these lectures online and learn something about biology. So, thank you. So we'll both be up here if you have questions, but I'd like to add a couple of things. Um, one is that if this works, we'd like this to be possible for every PhD student and postdoc at Yale University. It works. We'll see. We still have a ways to go to get it up online. We want to get feedback and so forth. But I think it's the kind of thing that represents a really sensible investment in the training of our graduate students and postdocs to be teachers. 
Um, the other thing I want to mention is that when we went down to the uh, magnet school and walked into that room, there was one white guy in the audience, three Hispanic males, and about 25 African-American females. That was the target audience. Maddie is a woman, but she's not a black woman. And I was really feeling at that point that I would like to have a role model that would stand up that actually looked like the audience. I must say that the audience didn't seem to be phased at all, and they gave you lots of, they were, yeah, yeah, Ma Ma they were great. They, Ma Maddie handed out questionnaires and they filled out all kinds of things. And they actually had quite a bit of give and take with her when we finished. The next person who's presenting decided that it would be nice to invite the students to Yale rather than going down to the magnet school, and so she's doing it at 17 Hill House in the teaching room at 17 Hill House, and the students are coming to Yale, which I think is great because it helps them to realize that, oh, maybe I could do this. So I think that's good for high school students. And with that, we have a few minutes for questions. I'm going to have to run because I have to catch a train to New York. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> what does the assessment look like in this program? So you mentioned um, feedback questionnaires with the students that you visited and kind of informal feedback from your peers. Is there a more extensive assessment before you roll this out to all grads, all PhD students? Um, yes, we're planning on uh, first getting assessment from the people who have done it after they've done it. So we're going to get, we're going to write a report on that. Um, we have not yet worked out exactly how we're going to get feedback from the web. Okay, and uh, so that's in development, but that would be a very sensible thing to do. It, uh, we can certainly do things like monitor numbers of hits and gather standard web-based statistics on it. It would be more meaningful to find out whether or not it actually did its job <laughs> in a substantive sense. That we haven't figured out yet. Yeah, David. Yeah, question about um about for your experience of <clears throat> trying to, to reach your target audience, how do you get back to that almost childlike sense of fun <laughs> and enjoyment in being a researcher so that you can communicate that? Yeah, I, I think that's something that I've developed through this process. Um, certainly the first time when I gave this talk at the Speakeasy to my peers, the second talk was very similar to talks that I'd given at conferences and but everyone listening in the audience was helping me by putting them into the mindset of someone who hadn't seen this before and saying like that figure is way too complicated what is the actual message here um, and so that's something I worked a lot on before bringing these talks to high school students thinking about what is the real story that I need to get across without I don't have to talk about all the statistics I need to focus on what did we learn from this? Um, and an, another thing that I focused a lot on um, that all of us in the program have been trying to do is to put more of ourselves into these presentations, to not have them just be dry, you know, here's what I can tell you about global vegetation. Um, in both of them, I, the first presentation I open with talking about how I come from Oregon and talking about the contrast between Eastern and Western Oregon in terms of what the vegetation looks like on either side of the mountains and using that to set up this whole topic of, you know, why is one place a desert and one place a forest? And similarly, in the, the second talk, I tried to put um, some of myself into it, pictures of myself in the field doing the research, talking about how, what did this mean to me? Um, and that was something that I got a lot of positive feedback on from the students that we spoke to that um, they thought it was really cool that I had actually done this work myself and that was something that made it exciting to them. Yeah. And we shared that kind of experience among all of them and we're trying to make sure that everybody tries to build something like that into the talks. But I think, as you've seen, one of the great things about the project is that I tried to give people agency as they went through. Maddie and Anna Vinton actually wrote the Rosencrantz proposal, 
And as you can see, she's very charming. She's very comfortable in her own skin. She's a really good ambassador for this kind of stuff. And in a sense, I'm totally irrelevant. <laughs> I just, I'm a cheerleader. Yeah, true. Um, could you, um, you were talking about going on the job market and things like that. Could you uh, maybe pull out even yet farther? Is this an advantage for the students, or is this bringing you up to par with the students? Is this becoming just a thing that everybody who's hiring somebody wants to see now, or is this new? What's the, what's the career and, and uh, job context for these things now? Uh, in my experience, well, Maddie hasn't been on the market yet, but I've been looking at candidates, and I can tell you I've never seen a candidate that brought anything like this to the table. And I think it's going to give, in the early years, it'll give our students an edge, but I suspect that if it proves to be effective, it will very rapidly spread, and then everybody will do it, and then it'll just be standard. Uh, that would be great. That might be 10 years down the road. Uh, but at the moment, I think that it will definitely be helpful, and... Um, it will depend on the kind of job that people are applying for. It will be more important if you're trying to get a teaching position at a liberal arts college than if you're trying to become a professor at Rockefeller University, which is only grad student research. Uh, but I would think that for many of our students, it should be quite helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, and thank you for having us uh, talk a little bit about our project today on behalf of my collaborators, Dr. Alexa Sidden and Dr. Christopher Tormey. I'd like to present some highlights uh, from our project that was funded by last year's uh, Rosencrantz grant entitled A Multidisciplinary Interactive Digital Peripheral Smear Course for Medical Students and Beyond. So it was a pretty wordy title, but I think this slide will kind of uh, give us a little bit of background in terms of what we are uh, presenting today. So to begin, I'd like to bring your attention to the importance of peripheral blood smear analysis, which is a very useful and cost-effective tool for patient care. It not only aids in the diagnosis of various blood disorders, but also in a variety of illnesses that present with blood cell abnormalities. And in the schematic below, we present to you sort of the gist of this. Here we have a patient's drop of blood, which is placed on one end of a glass slide. And then we have in the center here, we have a second slide, which is the spreader slide, which is then used to smear that drop of blood to make a more uniform layer so that we won't have very many overlapping cells. The slide is then stained, and then it is ready to be viewed under the microscope. And so for this last portion, we can then look at it from a bird's eye view, where under low power magnification, we can see uh, the majority of the cells as we scan through various fields. But then as we move up in the power of magnification, we can certainly then focus in on indiv individual cell structures and identify things much more readily. So on this slide, we bring up some representative peripheral blood smears. And on the left-hand side, if you focus on the two big cells with the purple nuclei, one of the things we can readily tell is as we look at the cellular structures, these slides are under high power magnification. So we can see that there are differences between the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm of these cells. And if you look on the right-hand side of the big cell with the purple nucleus, you'll see that the cytoplasm is much larger and that the cytoplasm also hugs or skirts the other surrounding red blood cells, which is quite different than the much more round shape of the other white blood cell here. And so that's one of the things that when we're looking at um, white blood cells, which are part of the immune system, so are these cells that are reacting to some process? So for example, if a patient is coming in with a viral syndrome, are these actually reactive types of lymphocytes, one type of white blood cell of the immune system, versus are they much more concerning in terms of a malignant appearing white blood cell that could be signs that the patient is actually presenting with a severe cancer like a leukemia? Moving on to the right-hand side, 
that slide, we see a different type of white blood cell. So again, looking at the purple nuclei, you'll see that they, there are many more lobes in this. This is a neutrophil. And this slide is actually meant to focus in on a type of platelet-related disorder that is inherited. So even though the platelet is, is actually to the left here, the little fuzzy bit, sort of smaller than the majority of the cells that are red blood cells, in this particular inherited disorder, one of the things we actually look at are white blood cells and some of the inclusions that we may see as well. And if you look at the bottom of that neutrophil, you'll see that uh, maybe at the back of the room it might be a little fuzzier, but basically it's a bluish gray kind of inclusion body. And that's pretty classic for this type of platelet disorder that uh, has a bleeding tendency for patients with a may heglin anomaly. And so the last representative slide here is focusing on really red blood cells, so you don't see the cells with the purple nuclei now. But you see that the shapes are different, and so in this case, we generally think of red blood cells as biconcave. When it goes through the vessels, it should be able to deform to squeeze through the smaller blood vessels. So in general, it's biconcave, and we'll see a uh, central area of clearing that looks more white, and then the surrounding red pinkish um, cell, but you'll see closer to the center that there are cells that are elongated. So this one is in a patient who presents with a pain crisis. So that type of cell shape is a sickle cell shape, and this patient has an underlying disorder of sickle cell anemia. So these types of slide reviews are so important, but Unfortunately, hematology courses nationwide have increasingly de-emphasized this type of training um, and also in the practical use of microscopes. There is evidence, however, that there is increasing demand for this type of peripheral blood smear interpretation from a clinical perspective. And certainly, we know that experts that are able to assist in an interpretation of urgent cases, unfortunately, are not available in a 24 setting, even in the hospitalized uh, cases, where, for example, in urgent cases where timely and appropriate identification of certain blood cell abnormalities may change uh, management of patients, and sometimes it can be critical in terms of even life or death situations. Locally at the Yale School of Medicine, peripheral blood smear education is limited to a handful of workshops, which is superficial in scope. And so in talking to a, our course director, the universal feedback he has received from first year medical students certainly has been more smears. The need for additional training is also validated in my area, so I'm a hematologist oncologist, and my fellows in training certainly tell us that they also would like much more exposure and teaching in this aspect. And one of the things that uh, my collaborators and I did sort of seeing informally this request was to see, was there really a knowledge deficit? And so in taking our first year hematology fellows before they started our training program, we actually did a um, series of smears with clinical vignettes and asked them to take that at the beginning of their fellowship and at the end of their first year of training. So certainly in terms of the pre-testing, uh, there was uh, evidence of a knowledge deficit and on, on average the score was 64% with a range of 44 to 78%. And even with one year of, of teaching and exposure to more smears, on the post-testing there was only marginal improvement and the average score was only in the 70% range. So there's certainly still a need. In addition, a recent study performed by my colleagues at Yale's affiliated VA showed that, as you look in this pie chart here, the blue area, 58% of electronic consults to the facility's lab medicine service were in the domain of hematology. And all of the hematology consults were actually for assistance with peripheral blood smear interpretation. So, one of the very gratifying things in my field is the ability to have a built-in 
uh, teamwork in terms of multimodality care for patients. And this has been a, a really uh, nice way to also expand this in terms of uh, the growing need for additional peripheral blood smear education and access. So in addition to the knowledge I bring in hematology and oncology, my colleagues to my right, Dr. Sidden and Dr. Tormey from Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, and two additional collaborators that I will talk a little bit about their work as well in cell biology and also in an, another area of internal medicine. <coughs> So we are very grateful to have received funding from the Rosencrantz grant, and so our target our, uh, audience for our project was certainly Yale medical students, primarily first year medical students, uh, but also a secondary uh, audience would also be in the postgraduates, um, hematology, oncology fellows, and also affiliated disciplines, laboratory medicine and pathology, et cetera. So our aims primary certainly was to create an online, interactive, educational supplement to medical student classroom peripheral blood smear learning. And so it, um, our goal was uh, accomplished with two ways. The first one really was to uh, collect a library of slides um, based on the patients that we would see that uh, had slides, um, scanning them to make them available in digital form. Uh, but also uh, using uh, software um, by one of our collaborators to be able to use a Google Maps sort of linking system uh, to be able to tag normal and abnormal cells and to be able to link them to question and answer with associated clinical vignettes. And then the second portion was to also have an animated series, particularly focusing on normal and abnormal blood cell development available for student review after class. Secondary goal would certainly to be ex to expand this online course from the above basics to a more advanced uh, level for postgraduate education. So the latter portion of our talk will just give you an update about where we are and what we've done so far. So as you can tell, uh, we're trying to be HIPAA compliant, so we've kind of um, blued out uh, because these are actual uh, cases uh, that we have been involved with from the clinical setting, but basically a tray of slides uh, with both uh, normal blood cells, but also a number of other conditions, um, approximately 30, but it continues to grow. So this is not inclusive, but one of the things that is uh, helpful in terms of blood smear is to realize that it can be uh, helpful in many other conditions, not just blood related. So um, in the top portion, various infections may present with blood cell abnormalities. And so things endemic to this region, like Babesia, for example, less common malaria and other, uh, but certainly very commonly around this time of year, still a lot of viral infections going on, the flu and things like that. And so we may see reactive lymphocytes, the cell I showed before in a past slide etc. But then also people who are deficient in nutrients may manifest with blood cell abnormalities. So iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, etc. Then we have certainly benign uh, hematology disorders, some of which are inborn, so hereditary states, others of which are acquired hemolytic anemia, as we talked briefly about sickle cell anemia, etc. Um, but certainly from the standpoint of cancer, there are also cancers that can be readily found in the bloodstream, primarily leukemias, and sometimes lymphoma, cancers of the lymph nodes can be found circulating in the bloodstream as well. And so we do have some representative cases of that. So in terms of our primary objective, this was the first uh, part in terms of having a library of slides scanning and so this is to show sort of where we are and some of the uh, representative slides. One sickle cell, so here is a link that will kind of show you. So when I showed you the three representative smears, that's a pretty artificial way in terms of learning because unfortunately when someone is faced with a smear that they need to look under the microscope, that's not what you automatically see. So basically, if you are under low power magnification and you have the slide, you will kind of see this 
from a bird's eye view, just lots of little dots, dots, dots. So you want to go higher magnification. Then you can start to see. So you can see, for example, the red blood cells, different shapes. I told you that the nucleus with purple, generally white blood cells, for example. So we can also look a little bit more so we can start to look went a little too quick at the internal structures. But basically, one of the things we are able to do is you will see under low power magnification, you have to scan in a lot of different fields and that what you see in one field may be quite different. Um, so larger fields may, uh, larger cells may clump together more in the edges of the slide. So you have to be careful where you look. If you are in an area where there are too many overlapping cells that may actually be artifact and not truly what is going on with the patient that you're trying to take care of. And certainly one thing that we know is that we see a lot of different strange appearing cells. But if we only see one of them in many, many fields, it's unlikely to be clinically important. And again, we always want to bring it back to the patient. So that's a very important So. Once we get into high-powered field, certainly we are much more able to identify the nuclear structures, the cytoplasm, are there granules, those little uh, dots inside the cytoplasm, certain inclusion bodies, if they're there, et cetera. And so the additional component that we are able to do with our cell biology collaborator, Dr. Peter Takazawa, is to really base on Google Maps and uh, Highlighting, for example, this one would be taken from Google Maps, right? Highlighting different locations, and you can zoom in, zoom out. Similarly, we're able to do that in our low power to high power, where if we want to then link, we are able to individually tag cells and then also link it to questions and answers and get automatic feedback to, uh, to patients and to know how to design uh, further. So the second portion of our project really was to do animated uh, series to explain. One of the things about hematology is it's a very visual field. And one of the things is it can be hard to kind of understand the development of the nucleus, for example. And the top part of the field is red blood cell development from the most immature where it's in the bone marrow to the mature where the this part, the erythrocyte, is ready to go into the circulation, which is where we typically see uh, the, on our peripheral blood smear. So typically, we would not see the larger cells uh, with the larger nucleus. Uh, we would see the mature form. So we can kind of see and then um, slow it down and kind of explain each of the differences. To kind of zoom in, this is the normal red blood cell development on the top. To zoom in, how about abnormal blood cells? Because that's a lot of what we see. Well, this again is another representative animation. Um, and this one um, is done with our internal medicine collaborator, Dr. Arnold Marlier, where we asked him to show how a bite cell is formed. So this is in the spleen where we have a red cell with hemoglobin, which forms red blood cells, but it's excess, so these little purple dots really are excess. It's trying to squeeze through a slit of the basement membrane of the endothelial cell as it's trying to squeeze through those denatured hemoglobin, Heinz bodies, sort of get left behind, pinched off, and then the remaining red blood cell membrane closes, but the shape remaining is not normal, and it's this bite deformity. So in conclusion, where are we in terms of our objectives? So we have some representative samples from both the slide library and the Google mapping, as well as the animation, but we have not completed it. So we're currently in the process of scanning the remaining cases, labeling the remaining slides, doing additional uh, cell developmental scenarios, making the Q&A and evaluations. And certainly our main hope was to be able to incorporate this into the 2019 Yale Medical Student Curriculum. And so to upload it into the database there and to implement it eventually to the postgraduate level. Um, with this, our hope is also for 
uh, presentation at a national meeting with publication afterward and with this educational tool also to be able to provide it potentially to uh, students and trainees outside the Yale medical community as well. So thank you for your time and attention. <laughs> and if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. And we're all. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering, given, given how visual uh, a field this is, and given that you're going through the trouble of essentially labeling a large database of these cells, uh, whether you considered using machine learning approaches to automate uh, the <laughs> diagnosis of these, these conditions? I would say it's uh, easier said than done. Uh, one of our colleagues actually uh, in our Department of Laboratory Medicine is actually working on that exact tool from a research perspective, but it's in its infancy right now. Um, really, I think we're at the point where we help the machine to learn how to recognize this morphology. We had actually considered that as part of one of our initial, as we were writing proposals up, it was just, uh, we actually consulted with this individual, it was just too much of its infancy stage at this point. I think probably in five to ten years, it's probably going to be something very realistic that we may be relying a lot more on machine learning, but uh, yeah. just a little too, not quite as fully developed yeah. at this point. Normal and abnormal is a spectrum, so it's not binary, black and white, and there, there are a lot of real world complications in terms of slide artifact and a lot of things that really the machine may not necessarily interpret correctly, so. Which may be in some ways related to that, uh, which is what is the, what is the sort of a rate of change? How often is this slide library going to need to be adapted or is it reasonably fixed? Yeah, yeah so, so there is a reasonable number of common diagnoses that we see that once the library is complete, it's always nice when you get a really great example to update it because some of these some of these things are very rare. We only see them maybe once or twice a year. And if the slide isn't beautiful, as if it's not the most the like most textbook example, it would be great to continue to update it. But with respect to your question, there are maybe ten diagnoses that are life or death. We need to know about them now in the next few hours. And so those are the ones that we're kind of at the top of our list that we want to make sure our medical students and fellows are most comfortable with. So those are our, our priorities right now. So our, um, the trainees that I oversee um, in hematology and oncology, so it's a combined service. So in hematology, there are uh, cancers of the blood, but also non-cancer related diseases. And so when our fellows in training take call, so basically a patient that they may never have seen, know nothing about, and they, they're the first one to respond, um, when they take call, one of the first things that they kind of, in terms of uh, prepping you know, the trainees, we tell them that hematology call can be one of the most nerve-wracking calls because some of the you get called in the middle of the night and you have to come in to see if this person has acute leukemia for example because there are some some that we we need to treat that very day that and where hours can even make a difference or if there's destruction of blood cells where we actually need to call on our colleagues to actually recirculate their blood and remove certain things uh, where again hours can be essential and so where we find that um, lack of this exposure and training really comes to a play where it uh, makes uh, it to be a particularly uh, big challenge for all involved. Yeah. The only thing I'll I think answer part of your question was we're, we're using very, very classic scenarios that really probably, if you look at a textbook from the early 1900s, probably had the same terminology. Um, so the rate of change, I think, is actually quite small. It's not like we're, we're not going to be using guideline documents or things that change on a frequent basis. So I think the, uh, this will be able to last in perpetuity for quite a while. As Alexa, so we could certainly add more rare entities in. But I think one of the beauties of this is that it really doesn't change all that much. It, I like the, treatment, the, yeah, the, the, the cell, diagnosis. Yeah, diagnoses yeah. are sort of are what they are. So. Um, I, w that's actually a nice aspect of, of this type of database. Thank you. This was fascinating. Um, one question about the technology used to uh, create the high fidelity images and the ability to zoom in, and uh, talking a little bit about e consults and whether there's a mechanism for the lab to 
be able to use that technology so that if a fellow or a trainee was concerned that I, I think that this is a concerning blood smear, I want to review it with a hematologist at three in the morning before I, you know, call in, um, you know, the whole team. Um, is that a future direction that might be um, applicable and something that might um, allow for, um, like, real-time feedback of interpretations? So it's, it's, it's a really good question. So right now, um, we do do laboratory e-consults, although to look at the blood smear in the middle of the night is not something that we can currently do. However, going back to your AI question, our, the newest series of um, uh, blood analyzers, they do actually make these smears and they do take pictures of them and they try to categorize their cell, the cells. They're not nearly as good as humans are, but one of the aspects of them that we are trying to take advantage of and will probably happen in the next few years at least is remote access to those things so then we will be able to remotely look at these these cells it's it's really helpful actually for like off-site small um, outreach clinics mm -hmm. where there's maybe an urgent clinical question or there's like a an intracellular parasite it it it, it would be a really useful technology and it's coming it's not quite prime time yet a lower tech way is um, you can actually take it with a smartphone, it's so it's, the quality is not going to be as good, but you can still get a lot of useful information and you take a picture from the microscope using the uh, smartphone and then text it to the expert. Any other questions we can have at the end? Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Um, and um, my name is uh, Sarita Soros. I'm one of the faculty members in the primary care internal medicine department, and I'll be presenting with my resident colleague, Dr. Brian Brown, um, about our project, Sugar Coated Science, um, in search of the medical education media best practices. So a little bit of background. Um, it, in our primary care program, we've been trying to uh, utilize more uh, utilize more flipped classroom uh, technology um, to really uh, optimize the time that we have with our learners, uh, both our residents and our medical students. Um, as medicine proliferates, there's more and more content that needs to be covered. And um, using adult learning theory uh, modalities, we recognize that we have a digital native um, group of learners. And rather than spend time in the class going over background knowledge and just doing a, a pure knowledge transfer, we can actually use our in-classroom time uh, to apply that, that knowledge to real patients um, and practice clinical uh, reasoning techniques. Um, we also want to make um, the, the resources that we use um, for kind of pre-work as fun and engaging as possible because we recognize that our residents and our medical students are quite busy. We want them to really want to engage in the material. And um, our kind of educational theory here was that if we use advanced organizers, um, which are kind of scaffold or um, things like analogies um, or acronyms that help learners translate complex um, material into something which is a little bit easier to retain, um, that we could actually help to make those flipped classrooms a little bit more fun. Rather than using things like a mnemonic, we wanted to explore the use of animation and medical education as an opportunity um, to work as an advanced organizer. So, um, for a little bit of a um, little bit more of background, um, a, a couple of the educational theories that we wanted to take into account uh, was balancing the cognitive load theory. So, we are going to have our learners uh, have some sensory information that's going to be in their working memory, and what we want to see is how are we going to be able to translate that into long-term memory. But we want to do that in a way that's not going to put too much germane load. Um, so. If we're going to use videos, we want those videos to be engaging, but not so engaging that it distracts the learners from the content that we want them to acquire. Um, and so that, that's something that's been published about using videos and using animation and videos. And so we wanted to study that as we looked at our advanced organizers. Uh, the other thing is we wanted to evaluate multimedia learning theory, um, or dual coding theory, um, and look at the synergy between sound and visual aspects and how they kind of activate our sensory um, parts of our brain, which can really enhance that long-term acquisition of knowledge and um, forming like durable memories. 
So the objectives of our project were to assess the feasibility of developing this digital animation skill set, especially as a clinician educator. So Brian and I are both trained as physicians, but uh, we've been gaining more educational skill sets as we go. Uh, neither of us have been trained in animation, but is this something that is feasible for um, a clinician to learn so that they can apply this as an educational tool? Um, likewise, we want to study a series of best practices to, again, optimize that, that balance between cognitive load um, while we're using these animations as an advanced organizer. And then lastly, we wanted to um, evaluate our learners um, to see how, how they want, the, you know, videos or flipped classrooms um, that use animation uh, to be developed so that um, we can take this one project and hopefully scale it up um, in other areas of our educational curriculum. I want to pass this over to Mike. Oh. So did the trailer not work or was it something? Or should I kind of go back? Oh, yeah. So um, thanks, Rita. So um, uh, you know, to take all this jargon and kind of give you an example of what these advanced organizers might look like, I figure rather than us telling you, we'd have the characters themselves tell you. Well, with me as well, I guess. So, um, is it not playing? Oh no. Oh. Let's see. What sugar-coated science has meant for me is that for the first time, the doctors who use us every day finally know the real me. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes. So nice of you to come and celebrate the beginning of my reign. The physiology of the diabetic patient is like its own little cosmos, and now we can all explore it. Dude, like, at first I was all like, filming is gonna be a drag. Yeah, I remember, but you ended up liking it. Heck yeah, we ended up getting some awesome footage. It was totally chill. From the pancreas to the periphery. From any unfortunate adverse reactions. To our mechanism of hardcore action. With the help of our friends here, we'll learn it all at... Sugar-coated science. Okay, just, you know, need to make sure you guys saw that. Um, so, uh... Yeah, so we wanted to find the intersection between all this uh, sort of adult learning theory and multimedia learning theory, and then take some of the skill sets of people actually in the trade that we were learning as novices, and find the intersection of those two. And so to approach this unique topic, we had to use some mixed methods to, to develop our lessons. So uh, first of all, we did do that literature review around some of that learning theory you just heard about. Um, and then it was some just kind of lay person internet searches about um, you know, how do you learn how to animate? What are the online resources to do that? What are the tutorials? What are the skills? So there's a lot of fun with that. And some of the logos I throw up here are some of those free programs that if people want to know later, I can go, I can tell you more about those. Um, and then we just kind of journaled along the way all of our lessons learned um, about uh, what is useful use of our time, what is um, not worth learning. Um, like CGI. Um, and then we did do a pre-test for our learners. So we were teaching specifically about diabetes and the drugs used for them. And so we, um, we did a pre-test about that and I'll talk about that briefly later. Um, and then our main thing was that as we created the, these uh, video products, we then did a focus group as a way of um, qualitatively assessing the learner response. So this is a uh, graphic, a, a, a wheel that's almost like a variant on the PDSA cycle from the quality improvement world um, that we uh, developed kind of in our process um, as a, what, what we think is a good step-by-step -step guide to creating a educational piece of multimedia. Um, and I'll mention in the research piece, um, so briefly discussing with key stakeholders for us that was going to the person who's in charge of our diabetes curriculum and saying, can we do this? Um, uh, learner survey, needs assessment I'll mention, and then content research was just making sure we knew about the information before we tried to teach it. Um, and, uh, and then those other specific ones as far as actually creating the, the video from there, I'll, I'll go into in other slides. So as far as uh, character design, that's one piece I wanted to highlight of something I learned from the animation tutorial world, but I think is kind of cool from an educational standpoint. There's this idea in, in um, 
in uh, the world of design, the four Ds of development. And so the first D um, for our seagull character, for example, we had to discover or research references. So pictures of real seagulls, as well as other people who made cartoon seagulls, what did they emphasize and de-emphasize? Then the design stage is your trial and error, where you're going to just make lots of sketches of what your character might look like, taking the features that you liked or didn't like from previous examples. And then develop is where you refine your design and design, you know, decide what um, accessories he's going to have, in this case, as part of what makes it educational. And finally, deliver, which refers to the finished product, which in our case was just going ahead and making the videos for another animator who might be pitching it to the client or something like that. Another key piece I wanted to talk about as far as the actual development process is storyboarding. And I want you to get a sense that one of the overarching themes here is all the steps of planning that you do to develop a piece of multimedia before you actually make it can really pay off because you can collaborate with your team members, even if they're non, um, you know, members of the team that are not specifically involved in making the actual video, they can provide their feedback and input and be included in each of these steps. And it helps you not have to backpedal later because as you'll see, the actual animation step is pretty time consuming. Um, so storyboarding is um, kind of self-explanatory, but basically you want to plan out what each shot is going to show, um, just like in any movie or show. In this case, it's because you want to have you know, those images that are going to maximize your intrinsic load and keep the distracting stuff um, on the periphery as much as possible. So here's an example of a storyboard for our upcoming episode three, actually. But you can see it's very quick kind of sketches and then some animations that we've started making um, with little notes and arrows. It could be very sloppy, but it's very useful as a communication tool. Okay, so uh, as far as the learner needs assessment, um, I didn't show all the uh, data here, but very briefly, basically folks were really excited about the idea of watching a video to learn more about the topic. Um, these are the two drug classes that we did our first episodes on. Metformin is uh, the most commonly used drug, so you can see that by the end of intern year, our folks are pretty comfortable. Um, but uh, for one of the new, um, more very highly effective, but um, uh, one of the kind of highly effective newer uh, drug classes, the SGLT2 inhibitors, which the seagull actually was. Um, even by the end of intern year in our prior curriculum, people were still very uncomfortable and were underutilizing these drugs and helping our patients. So briefly on the actual animating part, and again, this is stuff I could talk about all day, but you know, I can take questions afterwards. Um, so uh, I put up just a few examples of some of the types of workflows we came to ending up doing um, with the software we ended up getting used to and everything. And so in this one, um, we're using a type of animation called vector animation, which, oh, okay, thanks. Um, so uh, vector animation, which is where um, you have a kind of, it's a 2D image and you create these uh, digital shapes that are very easy to manipulate over a timeline. So once you make them, it's very easy to animate. So um, we start with a, a pencil sketch. You take a phone picture of it. Um, so that's the only step that really requires any artistic ability. And then from there, um, you upload it into free software, and you can vectorize it. Then you can animate it in another program, and then use um, something like iMovie um, to kind of put the final touches. Um, another example, I won't belabor this um, for the sake of time, but basically there are ways to, if you have an image, you can actually easily add what's called a skeleton or bones to that image. And that's another easy way to take a picture you have and make it easily start moving around. Um, so I'll pass it back over to Sarita to talk about our focus group results. So we had a series of focus groups as we, um, again, used an iterative process as we had, you know, our initial episode, we had a focus group to kind of talk about some of the, the you know, questions that we were concerned about, but also get um, other, um, you know, ideas from the group as we continued this process. Um, and there was a few themes that we'll highlight. One was the amount of text that we used. Um, whether there was too much text on the screen, it kind of, again, distracted our learners. But if there wasn't enough text for signposting, um, then our learners felt that um, some of the um, animation topics were a little bit too abrupt. And so over time, we've really learned to try to uh, hone in on that optimal balance. And we're hoping to really utilize a lot of that feedback as we move forward. Um, I, again, like the real goal here is that we want um, the characters, um, so again, uh, diabetes drugs are these static chemical molecules and we're going to anthropomorphize them. We're going to give them a story. Um, we're going to give them a personality. And um, our learners felt that that was actually quite helpful and it was um, an ability for them to have a memorable character in their mind that they could springboard off of different um, details that were important. Um, one thing was 
you know, as we move through the classes of diabetes medications, um, there are classes where there are, you know, eight or nine different drugs that have similar but slightly different um, features. And so um, one of the pieces of the feedback was use your animation and use the colors and what, you know, the, the characters are saying or what they're wearing as an ability to help us distinguish some of those de details. Um, as uh, you know, we, we got a little bit fancier with the animation. We also learned, though, that um, too much um, accoutrement um, on the characters might actually be somewhat distracting unless it was very intentional. And so the intentionality of everything on the screen was really a key feature. Um, and again, you know, with the animation, um, the, it was actually interesting for us because with the digital native group, we thought that um, more high fidelity uh, cartoon, um, you know, animation would actually be uh, more engaging. Uh, but our learners really felt that, you know, you can stick with simple um, animations, um, but, it, you know, really, you know, looking at how you're using that animation and telling a story um, you know, having a, a script. We, we initially started with a talk show format and then we had a little bit more of a documentary. And really the, the feedback is the more that you can tell a story, it's gonna stick in our mind. And so we're really, you know, our, our upcoming episode is almost gonna be like a Western animation action movie um, so that people hopefully can hold onto that story, hold onto the characters and have long-term memory of the details that are important. So, um, you know, just like we learned, we want to have a summary at the end of the video. I'm going to pass this over to Brian for a summary of the lessons that we've learned. Nice. All right, so to wrap up, I'm just going to summarize some of the lessons learned that uh, weren't already uh, fully stated. So um, there's limited peer review literature on this, so it's a great opportunity to take what's out there in the real world that people are animating and combine it with what we do know and do some cool scholarship. Um, time is the greatest barrier, so um, the key to that is develop a team, and we've had some luck that uh, finally after a few episodes we have some other team members coming on who are learning some of these steps along the way, and we're starting to have a nice uh, assembly line for making these, um, and if anyone else wants to join, feel free. Um, and uh, planning at the early stages is key, so uh, feedbacking around the script, the storyboard, character design before you start doing all that work is really important. Uh, and then again, um, we use the grant uh, for a lot of the hardware and to get the ball rolling, but really this is pretty generalizable because so much software is, is free and available um, that anyone could really do this. Um, and then finally, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, oh yeah, so learners were super excited about this um, and hopefully you guys were too. Um, and again, uh, you don't have to be an amazing artist to, um, to accomplish this stuff. Um, and it was really fun to like, take drawing classes online just to, for this project. So future directions, um, so uh, also the Center for Teaching and Learning hooked us up with Panopto, so that allows us to get a lot of interactiveness going with multiple choice quizzes and um, table of contents and uh, being able to change the speed of the video. Um, all that has been shown in the literature to be very helpful to learners. Um, another episode, so the Western is coming. Um, growing the team, as I mentioned, spreading the skills through the department, designing a workshop to train other educators in these skills, and then hopefully eventually having an appraisal tool where uh, educators can have a peer tool that they use to uh, give structured feedback to other people on whatever multimedia teaching they're doing, and then finally, hopefully, an Academy Award someday. So uh, with that, we'll take any questions. Do you guys post these to YouTube, or how, how do you disseminate the videos? Good question. So that um, has been a variable process, partially because we had to decide as we are going how we wanted to collect information on it. So uh, for our actual target learner audience, we've been keeping it on Panopto, where they log in and we get to collect nice rich data about how long they're on there and, and how much they use it. Um, and then we've shared it um, otherwise with like private YouTube links and Google Drive and things. But um, so. Well, you could, of course. Um, it's just a matter of uh, in this uh, right now we're protecting it a little while we study it, but absolutely it could be disseminated. Yeah. Um, did you get any comments in your focus group, or did it come up in other, any other situation? Um, issues of uh, aesthetics or affect and style. Your the video you showed us was very playful, uh, and did people did anybody think that's inappropriate, or you know people read levels of playfulness very differently? Right, um, and I think that th that's a great point. Um, we recognize that um, although we have a target learner group that are, you know, quote unquote millennials, um, people have different levels of um, of wanting that that playfulness or th that types of style. Um, and so I think, 
uh, that is a little bit of a challenge. I think knowing your learner group is always the best way to target you know, your educational content. And I think if you're gonna be having online videos where you don't actually know your learner, that's a little bit more challenging. I think we learn to kind of tone things back a little bit, but recognize that, you know what, again, that story and uh, making those characters memorable is actually important. So how are we gonna do that in a way that's not um, overwhelming, distracting, or otherwise, you know, um, bothersome to the learner and I, I think that's where our focus groups have been really helpful because um, now we're starting to, to even work with some of our growing team around the storyboarding and the character development so that we're not overshooting in terms of hitting that optimal amount of uh, engagement. Were there, were there some subjects that you deemed like just did not lend themselves well to this format like something maybe that you were interested in doing and then decided it wouldn't work? No, I, th I think we, I, I, I think we had to yeah. pare down, if anything, just because um, when you become an expert in a drug, you actually end up knowing more than a doctor needs to know on a daily basis, treating patients, and so if anything, it was paring down. So like our next ones are these, um, some of them are an injection pen, and originally we were saying, well, do we need to teach them how to use the injection pen, so does the dragon's head need to be shaken and then spin around like the pen would be, and we said, nope, they don't need to learn that because that's going to change with the new product soon, so, um, but yeah, so if anything, um, yeah, we haven't run into anything that has been a challenge to represent metaphorically. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so first, I'd like to start by way of introduction, uh, who we are. So in the middle, we have uh, Kaveh Koshnud. He is a pr an associate professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health, whose idea all of this was. Uh, on the left, we have Sonam Lama, a uh, graduate of the Yale School of Public Health and now a research researcher at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital. And then on the right we have me, just to remind myself to introduce myself. Uh, I'm an eight-day-old PhD from the psychology department. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and I am the one who, who built what we'll be talking about. So my, my role was mainly to feed drips of inspiration to the other two of them in terms of how to design a game. But the actual script was written by Sonam, the idea came from Kaveh, and I, I just implemented, implemented the thing. I'm way down at the implementation level. Uh, in terms of what we did, we were interested in using a simulation-based approach to teaching epidemiology students about uh, real-world crises going on, about how they would approach something like the cholera crisis in Yemen from an epidemiological perspective. Uh, and there's a, a few nice things about simulation-based learning. It's it hones your problem-solving skills. It's very immersive. It's very interactive. It's very dynamic. And it's very, very memorable when you do it. So recently, uh, last semester, I believe, uh, we had the privilege of doing the simulation with the Naval War College, where you've got like 30 people in a room, all trying to figure out how to help some hypothetical uh, nation deal with some hypothetical crisis. So in this case, I think we were helping the government of Honduras deal with some big public health crisis, and you had to, and each of us had different roles and represented different groups. So for example, I represented the U.S. Army, or the U.S. Navy, I should say. I was Admiral Udenberg, and I came in with all of my, my warships full of medical supplies, and I had to dump them uh, onto the, the uh, people of Honduras. And the thing is that it's a very interactive scenario. You're there for hours of the day. Uh, you have actual professors at the Naval War College guiding you through all this. You've got these figurines that they made of the, representing the different warships or vessels that you have. Uh, and it's a, it's a very involved process. Uh, so as a result, even though it's amazing, it's also very expensive. It's very time consuming. And it doesn't scale very well. It doesn't scale well at all. So uh, with that in mind, we were hoping to take inspiration from this kind of approach, but applying it to public health and in a, using, using a, a method that can better scale and be uh, sort of exported to the rest of the world easier. So we had hoped to create an online game, essentially, that would allow people to go through what it would be like to be an epidemiological researcher or sort of aid worker in Yemen while this crisis is unfolding. Um, and we did this by simply making a, a basic, simple, interactive fiction game. Uh, have any of you played like text-based adventure games before, like Zork or uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, this sort of thing? For those of you who are unfamiliar, essentially, 
you are placed in some scenario and you have some set of actions you can take, like here you're in, in your bedroom and you could do things like pick up your toothbrush and brush your teeth and stuff like that by typing into this kind of interface. But given that when we looked at our students who we had in these, this classroom, this is designed for a course, by the way, that Kaveh is teaching. Um, and given when we looked at these students, they weren't necessarily familiar with this kind of interface. So we used a much simpler sort of multiple choice based interface to say, okay, here's where you are, here are the actions you can take now. And based on the choices that they make, the scenario unfolds in a different fashion, right? So it, it's kind of like a, a choose your own adventure sort of thing. Like if you've read an R.L. Stein Goosebumps novel or something, it's like turn to page 48, except we do the page turning for you. <laughs> um, and we're, based on Kaveh's interest, Kaveh is an epidemiology professor. He's big into the cholera crisis in Yemen. This is a huge uh, problem I learned because he told me. And I say it's because he told me in the sense that it's not really getting much coverage. It's, it's this massive, massive, massive crisis. Millions of people affected. Uh, it, uh, the scale of, of loss is, is hard to describe. So it seems like a good test bed for this kind of uh, approach. Um, so actually, because this is completed, this has already been administered to his, his class. It's a relatively small class. I think it's about a dozen people. But they've gone through this, this game and everything. So I thought we'd, we'd spend less time talking about the process and everything. I just made it with very basic web technologies. Uh, so it's easily exported, easily transmitted to other people. You could go online and use it now for yourself. But we'll just, let's just walk through it a little bit. So for example, this is the, this is the entry screen. We're not going to linger on here. There's a lot of text. There's a lot of reading for people to do. But we can go through uh, and see some things. There's a lot of video embedded throughout the, uh, throughout the game because this is a, a learning tool. This is for people to learn about what's going on in, in Yemen, what the uh, scale of loss is like. There are many links throughout for people to... Uh, learn about the background. So this is a big background knowledge slide. This is like, you know, an hour of reading practically. You have to learn about the, the, the culture of Yemen. You have to learn about uh, the local health system, all sorts of stuff. You need to learn about what deficiencies there are currently. But once you've read everything, then you can go in, this is one more video, and start the game. So for example, you start off by flying to Yemen, and you're meeting people that you're going to be working with, and you're reading articles on the, news, on, on the plane that are in a newspaper that you spot. And then you land at the airport. And you're, you're met with your first set of choices. So as you exit the plane, you see a car waiting for you and your team. There are militant groups with guns driving around the airport. The place is deserted except for a few officials from international relief organizations unloading their aid materials from their cargo aircrafts. You're curious about the situation and want to speak to someone. Who do you speak to? So now you can decide that you're going to talk to aid officials... You're going to talk to the militants, or you're going to get into your car. Let's, let's just go with something random. And the, the order of these buttons is randomized, so you don't, from playthrough to playthrough. So for example, what if we wanted to talk to the militants? They seem like a, a nice group of guys to talk to. Oh, you're done. You've been captured, and now you need to start over. So if we start over, you get taken back for now to the like, part where you need to learn how to be a person in this environment. This is where you learn all your regulations. This is where you learn that you're not supposed to talk to militants. So you come back here, learn that, and move on. If we talk to eight officials, we're talking to them, and now they're telling you, hey, we're here for, we've been here for a couple of weeks. You, you're, this is a colleague from grad school that you've met before, and they ask you to join them. If you join them, up, oh, you've been captured again because you're not supposed to stray from your team. You've gone off into a dangerous environment, right? So we're really trying to hammer in this point that you... You follow, you follow the security protocols. Um, but suppose you get into your car, then you can start to, to do things. You can do all sorts of things from there, from there on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's basically how the game unfolds. And you, you go from arriving in Yemen to eventually meeting one of the, the, the princess of Yemen and all sorts of stuff and trying to figure out how to, how to best approach this crisis. And let's just get back to the slide. So it's already been administered. This is done. Uh, we used the money from the Rosencrantz grant uh, to essentially pay me and Sonam to make this. Uh, Kaveh had the idea for all of this. Kaveh provided guidance all throughout. Sonam actually wrote the scenario. So all that text there was like 95% Sonam. 
uh, and then I just built the infrastructure that allowed people to click buttons and do what have you. So in terms of feedback, uh, generally it's been very, very positive. People are learning all about the, essentially, that culture affects these sorts of things, which is not necessarily something you would think from first principles. You might think that there's a one-size-fits-all approach to public health or to dealing with huge uh, crises of, of, of disease. Um, we also, throughout the game, we also make a note of how much this affects the people working there. So you as a worker are going to see some pretty horrific stuff, and that can affect how you how you engage with that kind of environment and that you need to take time to, to, to care for yourself throughout that. Um, and lastly, it, it, we want to hammer home that even though this is just a series of videos and text and, and, and pictures, it, it was immersive for people, that people felt connected to the scenario. Um, so for next steps, we were hoping to sort of implement a decision tree printout. So as you know, each decision is dependent on your previous decision, and it's a big branching tree structure. Uh, but by the time you get to the end of the game, it's nice to be able to see where you went wrong, what you could have improved on. So we'd like to implement essentially like a big flowchart of what decisions you have made throughout. That's a little bit uh, easier said than done, but it is doable. So that's one of our next steps. Um, another thing is that we could provide better guidance on what exactly is an ideal response. In some cases, perhaps, uh, even with all the background we gave them, it may not have been the case that it's obvious what the ideal uh, answer would be in a, given, in a given situation, so we'd like to provide more feedback about that. And then new variations of this. So this was all from the perspective of someone working with uh, medicine, like I think with MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, but you can imagine we're coming in from the World Health Organization, or you're coming as uh, a U.S. Army worker, and each of those different groups would have very different interests and ways of approaching the, the, the scenario. Um, and lastly, because this is, a, this is an online tool, it's very, very small, it's a single file, it's just some pictures and things, uh, this is very easily exported to people around the world, people all over. You could go online using the link that was up earlier yourself. Uh, and yeah, that's basically it. Thank you so much for everything. Question? Sure. Is there a stated either specific or general goal for the game? And when do you know when you've arrived? Is there like a final? Yes. Um, the, the goal for the game is essentially, so let's actually go back to the, So you, you will know you've reached the end of the game because we tell you this is the end of the game. You get to go back home um, once you're done. But the problem is that this is an unfolding crisis and there, there is no, no way to resolve this. And part of the lesson is that you are just a little cog in a tiny machine tuning onward. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it would be cool if there was like an, an impact gauge. So like after you yes. complete it, there's like... These are the things that you've done. Yeah, these are the things that you've done. These are, this is where you sort of didn't maximize your yeah. potential. Agreed. That, that's part of the, the idea of the, the decision tree printout as well. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Um, it's really cool. One thing I did notice is that there is a lot of text. Yes. And I was wondering if you had thought about maybe be, making it an audio thing instead of text. Oh. That might if anybody commented on the amount of text in the... Yeah. Um, in the very beginning, there's a lot more text than later on because the beginning is so background heavy. We incorporated a lot of the background uh, sort of reading that would be for the class into the, the very beginning of it. But you're right about that. Nobody commented on the heaviness of the text. Uh, the nice thing about text is that it's easier to, to transmit. Um, text is much smaller than equivalent audio files. Audio files would make it much more engaging. Um, I'm just thinking, like at the beginning of like a first-person shooter game, it's like you are blah blah blah, and it's talking to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And it's engaging. I think that's definitely something to consider. I think it's cool and engaging. Yes. Sorry, you had a question next, or no? Okay. 
Hey, what's up? Oh, just how long does it take to progress through the game, like with all the readings and stuff? With all the readings, I think it takes um, like a couple hours, basically. Uh, the readings are relatively short. There's lots of them, but they're relatively short. Two to three hours. Yes. If you had um, other content that you wanted to present in this way, did you build into this, or are you planning to build like a framework so that it would be easy for maybe like a faculty member, or somebody to say to give you like a set of word documents or a structured outline yeah. or something? Yes. This is this is this is a very generalized thing. I can build these very very easily now. <laughs> once once you give me a clear clearly labeled word document with like this is the path that you take, this can be made very easily. <laughs> this wouldn't take, it wouldn't take me more than like a week to do, basically. Yes? As a future direction, would there ever be the opportunity to like video chat with an expert? So if you had um, experts in the field and if you're in the midst of making a, a decision that you're kind of struggling over, it would be kind of cool that, you know, to actually have you know, someone in the you know, aid department that you could, you could ask real-time questions to, um, depending on like what the content of the game would be kind of moving forward. Oh, so you mean build, build into the game a sort of Skype-like interface yeah. where I could then chat with, say, you as an, as an expert in yeah. uh, stuff? Um, I feel like that would be... A, so I feel like it would be easier to incorporate, to just use available tools for that, incorporate, like, say, Skype or Discord or Slack or something into the game rather than try to build that infrastructure from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, that would depend entirely on the availability of the experts. Um, experts' time is expensive, and this is designed for public health students who are paying an ex a ridiculous amount of tuition to the school, but still not enough, I think, to get that kind of individualized care. Yes? You could maybe simulate that by f filming experts mm -hmm. with specific questions. That is true. You're in this section, and you say, you know, yikes, what do I do? And you would have somebody even filmed in the field saying, oh, I see you're at section X, this is what you should do. Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's great. And I feel like that, that uh, there's a lot of synergy, potential for synergy there with our first speaker who is uh, hoping to have uh, students generate teaching clips of themselves. Uh, we could use that, that, that infrastructure to, to generate those clips. That's right. Very cool. Thank you so much. I'm Sarah Schaefer. I'm uh, one of the faculty members in the Department of Neurology, specifically with a focus on movement disorders, which for those of you who don't know is Parkinson's disease, tremors, and things like that. Um, and my presentation is on the development of interactive video-based modules for movement disorders education. So the pop population that I'm currently targeting is neurology residents, but as you'll see as I go through it, I think that this uh, a lot of levels could be made out of uh, what I've done so far, and it could be um, it could be designed for all different levels, including medical students, uh, primary care providers, community neurologists, uh, and even fellows in movement disorders. So the problem, the reason that I wanted to do this is as going through residency, I actually wanted to go into movement disorders and I was still getting so little exposure that by the time I graduated, I felt far more comfortable dealing with an acute intracranial hemorrhage than with Parkinson's disease. Even though Parkinson's disease is an enormously common um, is enormously common in the population. And I think that this limited uh, exposure to movement disorders has translated into a limited interest by neurology residents in movement disorders. In 2017, for 62 fellowship spots in movement disorders, there were only 47 applicants. And with the aging population and Parkinson's disease being the biggest thing that we see, this is obviously a problem. So the status quo for neurology education in movement disorders and other outpatient specialties is they get a clinic here or there and they get lectures. But nobody goes to lectures. I'm sure every department has the same problem. And they don't correlate with what they're seeing. So the lectures, we do a two-week block once a year. And somebody could be on their outpatient rotation during that time. Or they could be on stroke. Or they could be on neuro ICU. And they're not seeing any of these things. And so there's no, they don't close the loop in terms of what they're clinically seeing. Also, short attention spans, especially, um, I don't know if any of you are millennials, but 
in the millennial population, um, they, uh, they're not paying attention uh, for more than 15 minutes or so to lectures. And there are a lot of variable learning styles, levels and paces of learning. And I wanted to build something that was going to be able to cater to, to that and, and accommodate all of these different issues. So I proposed uh, designing online interactive learning modules that will use real patient videos so that they get the experience of actually seeing a patient with these disorders um, while they're learning about the disorders and um, accommodates a variety of learning styles and paces. They can go through the modules at their own pace, at their own time. Um, and I used a combination of visual and auditory and all sorts of different um, uh, ways to make the media so that people uh, who are visual learners or auditory learners or other types of learners would be able to learn from the modules. Um, obviously it's flexible, they can access them at any time, any day or, um, you know, day or night, and they're very easy to disseminate. So the first step was I created, so movement disorders is a field that where their idea, the Movement Disorder Society's idea of medical education is to film a guy standing next to a PowerPoint slide and then split screen that with his PowerPoint presentation. That's literally what they have on their website as their education, right? So um, in addition to that, there is no, um, there's actually very little by way of, um, a scaffolding for how to approach movement disorders. The language that we use is all over the place. There's a lot of debates within the field. It's, it's completely ridiculous. Um, and uh, so the first thing that I had to do was come up with a scaffolding, actually, in order to say, these are the words that I want you to use. These are the words that apply to this movement disorder. And these are the words that apply to this movement disorder. Um, and that had actually never been done. So. I came up with first a, uh, a tree mod, uh, uh, model, and that was shot down by the, my division head, and I eventually came up with an, uh, another scaffolding that I'll show you, um, it, and made that into an introductory video that's about seven minutes that they watched before doing any of the modules, and then the modules are based on that scaffolding. And then um, I planned for 10 modules covering basic movement disorders I wanted in this first round to really cover the stuff that's common. So Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, tics, uh, et cetera. And eight modules are now complete and two are in production. So this is the uh, introductory video. As you can see, my scaffolding over here is uh, based on voluntariness, rhythmicity, pattern, and texture of the movement. And up here I have an example, tremor is an involuntary, oop, an involuntary rhythmic oscillatory movement. And then over here um, on the next slide of this, uh, of the introductory video, I say, okay, we're using the word oscillatory, what does that actually mean? It's alternating agonist and antagonist muscles, like you see in a seesaw, going back and forth, causing a tremor. So this sort of introduces you to the language, introduces you to the scaffolding, so that you can go into the modules with a good idea of what you're talking about and what the words mean. And then to create the media, we primarily used Camtasia. For those of you who are not familiar, this is uh, the camp what Camtasia looks like. This is the video that we're creating. This is um, a, a real patient video that we inserted into here. And then we put text and you can animate it and voice over and do all sorts of things. Um, I also used PowerPoint. You can voice over PowerPoint in, with Camtasia and record, um, record that. Um, and we've created 90 videos so far. Uh, for the eight modules, uh, which I will show you. Um, I'm not going to show you actual videos because that will take too much time, but I'll show you examples of screenshots that we did. So these are some of the screenshots. So up here, I had uh, one of my neurology colleagues who's artistic draw this brain, and then Brian Brown actually um, animated it so that the thalamus pops out and pops back in, and it shows you um, this was actually for this essential tremor model, uh, module and telling you about deep brain stimulation and why that works for essential tremor. 
This is another example where I took real patient MRI scans um, and showed normal versus abnormal side to side. This is the hummingbird sign, which is why this little hummingbird is here. You can see that the pons in the midbrain looks like a hummingbird. Um, this is a split screen where I have a, a tremor flow sheet and I'm showing you on the left the gentleman with his actual tremor happening and saying, oh, look, there's this tremor during this and so he has a rest tremor and there's this tremor during this, so he has a postural tremor. And here's another example of where I had a video of a, a gentleman walking and I was able to pause, stop the video to point things out and then have him and restart the video to have him walk so that they knew what they were looking for. Um, here's a, um, this is the exact same patient doing the exact same examination pre and post deep brain stimulation surgery. This is an intraoperative video of an awake patient getting deep brain stimulation surgery and they're turning the DBS on and off and showing how it's helping with the tremor while he's in the OR. This, I'm still figuring this out, but this is um, an actual chalk talk where I'm able to draw on the screen um, the graphs while I'm talking about what I'm drawing. And this is um, an example of one of our wrap-up videos that we have at the end of every module where we do the, the basic learning points um, with video, uh, videos that we've shown in the modules. So that was the media, and then there's the module creation. So we ended up putting the modules into Qualtrics, and thanks, Gary, for all your help with that. Um, we went through a lot of different iterations of what we were going to do uh, and finally landed on Qualtrics. Um, and uh, I hired students to do this uh, based on worksheets of how I wanted the modules to flow that I wrote myself. Um, and the great thing about Qualtrics is that you can actually use display logic for conditional answers. So if they answer a question correctly, it can go to one, uh, to the correct, and say, oh, this is correct because blah, blah. If they answer incorrectly, it can say, this is incorrect because blah, blah, try again, and they can go back. So it's like a choose your own adventure, like that other guy was saying, um, yes, <laughs> um, where uh, uh, you, it, it goes based on what you actually do. Um, we ended up housing the videos on YouTube. We started with Panopto, but um, it, and when we originally used Panopto, it could be accessed outside of Yale, but in the middle of me making these modules, they got rid of that feature, and I want to be able to use the modules outside of Yale, so we had to move all of them to unlisted videos in YouTube. And um, each module leads the learner through a description. So rhythmic is a descriptive term, phenomenology, tremor is a phenomenology, diagnosis, essential tremor, workup and treatment, um, comparing and contrasting between and within modules for different patients. And um, I had several experts review each module for content and modified them based on what they said. So this is Qualtrics. These are, this is display logic where it says, if you answer the, the correct answer, it goes to this screen. If you answer the incorrect answer, it goes to this screen. And um, this is what the module looks like. So we have, you can see that um, it has like the same things that it had in the introductory video of descriptive terms. They can use it on their, on their phone as well. This is an example of um, not a question, but just a description of, hey, isn't this interesting? Look at this video to find out more about this. So we're currently piloting the modules with nine neurology residents and fellows, and the feedback so far has been really positive, um, but we haven't quite gotten through the pilot yet. We did a pretest. We're going to do a post-test and survey and do some semi-structured interviews after we're done. Um, and then as far as future directions, we are currently reaching out to other residency programs to do a multi-center um, trial of these modules, of the first 10 modules for the next 2018 to 19 academic year. Um, and there's some interest um, from the uh, American Academy of Neurology Program Directors Consortium. They're starting a medical education research consortium and they want to potentially use this uh, which would mean it would probably be used piloted at about, at about 20 programs and I'm going to be applying for the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology educational grant which will give me 
enough time and money for the next two years to make levels like I was talking about in terms of a medical student level or beginner level, an intermediate level, and an advanced level. Um, and uh, ultimately distribution, I haven't quite figured that out yet. It is in a format where it is distributable outside of Yale. Um, so once we decide who we're going to give it to and how, um, it'll be easy to do. So this is the creative team, that's me obviously. Lena has been instrumental in helping with inputting Qualtrics and Parak has been making videos for me. Uh, Brian did the animation and Stacy did the uh, brain and Moises did some of the other, um, uh, anim or the, um, other pictures that were in there like the Seesaw people. Um, the content team, this is, these are all the people in my division and Jeremy Moeller is my, was my faculty advisor when I was a, um, a fellow and I should have put technical team like Matt and Gary and Tripp and everybody who's helped me figure it out, Camtasia and Qualtrics and, and all that stuff. Um, so that's it. Any questions? Um, so I, I think this works great as you know you start and you follow through the path. Is there um, any plans to make like a, a reference mode? So once people have passed through and kind of graduated, can't, is there any way for them to then go back and immediately be able to look at, you know, say the videos on Essential Tremors without like out of the context of this? So the um, so they can go into individual modules easily and within the modules we have um, a table of contents so uh, uh, there's description, phenomenology, diagnosis, treatment, etc. So they could go to an individual section of that table of contents and skip the previous part. Yeah but the videos individually are not available anywhere at the moment. Yeah, that but they could be. <laughs> um, and then how do you plan on like implementing this into the curriculum of say a, a, like a med student? Once it gets there, do you, do you think this will just be, you know, use it if you want it or will it be mandated that they pass through it or? So for, so, for the residents, it's going to be mandated that they do it during their outpatient clinical rotation. Um, and so that's usually two or four weeks, and they would do it at their leisure during that time. For medical students, you know, the medical school is pretty protective of required things for their medical students. I could envision it as being most useful during their clerkship, their neurology clerkship. Um, but that clerkship is, you know, four weeks and they're learning all of neurology. So I, I might pick, you know, half of the modules or three or four of the modules that I think are the most, you know, really need to know and, and make those required and the rest um, optional. Yes. Um, I think that Qualtrics is great as like a sort of first pass sort of thing. I've used Qualtrics in the past, um, but the moment that you need to like sort of scale this or you need more control over things, it, 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 can, it can hamper you. It's super glitchy. Yeah. I really I hate mean, Qualtrics, <laughs> actually. It's, no, it's, it's, working, it's working great for this, but it is glitchy. I mean, it, it throws all sorts of wrenches at me, and I'm like, what are you, what is happening? It's great for piloting. Yeah. It's horrible for maintaining a larger project. Yeah. My thing that I just showed you is very, very easy. Um, to just because it seems like what you're doing is sort of like what I'm yeah. doing. If you it's not could, glitchy at all. If you could <laughs> tell me how to use that, what what did you use? Uh, I built it from scratch. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, great. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have it? <laughs> it's just a website. It's, okay. If you ha if you are f if you're familiar with how to code for the web, it's it's easy. Well, I'm yeah. not. Okay, I am, and we can talk. Okay, great. That would be uh, great. That was kind of what I meant about having a framework so that yeah. if, if you know. Sarah would just have to, you know, there was a way to import like a word document or something, or even, yeah. I imagine that you would it's, have to be manual. It's a little bit, ma it's a little bit more manual than that, but it's very, it's literally just transliteration as opposed to like doing all this crazy display logic and Qualtrics messing up your life and yeah. being very untransparent. Yeah, all, it will like all of a sudden delete something and I'm like, where did it go? Or, or like the next button will be over here yeah. randomly and I'm like, why? Why, <laughs> why is it over there? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Also, if Qualtrics yeah. just isn't a company anymore, everything you've built is gone. 
Whereas, so long as I have the web, <laughs> my stuff will remain. Like, okay, that's well, I would love to talk further. It would be, it would be really great because Qualtrics is driving me nuts. Yeah. yeah. So, You might think about hosting the videos in, in an Amazon S3 bucket, which you can get through Yale. Because um, uh, that way you could, I think, maybe organize them. I'm, I'm imagining in YouTube, you just, they're just kind of thrown up there. And you don't have a lot of control over, I mean, once they're there, I think they're there for the world, right? Yeah, well, they're, unlisted. they're unlisted. Um, I mean, you can anybody can access them if they have the link, but they're not searchable. So, um, yeah. But I don't know what an S3 bucket is. Yeah, it's just, I mean, uh, yeah. both of you, can you can, yeah, we can talk. Panopto was great, and it was great when exactly. I was allowed to yeah. share them outside of Yale, but, you know, that went away. So. <laughs> That's the thing about using these services. Like, yeah. They couldn't be deprecated at any time. Everything originally, when, yeah, when I originally co conceptualized this, I had put in my budget like for coding something that would allow me to do this not in one of these platforms, but ultimately we decided that the plat this platform was the easiest thing to do, but I agree with you that it's not the final option. Yeah, I was saw that as a pilot. Yeah, pilot. absolutely. Right. I've, I've done the same. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I think we'll move on to our final presenter. Excellent. Thanks, Trip. Thanks for bearing with me to the bitter end. I'm Monica Bravo. I'm a lecturer in the history of art and the program on ethnicity, race, and migration. Um, so this project, I'll try to keep it short, it uh, grew out of a class that I've been teaching. I taught it for the last time last spring. It's called Visual Culture of the National Parks. And the course uh, really came out of, um, I was sort of inspired by the centennial of the national parks in 2016, as well as the Trump inauguration, which of course gave rise to the rogue national park um, Twitter accounts. And it's a course that is a way of teaching American art across a variety of different media and sort of in a non-period um, uh, dependent way as well. Uh, the course is cross-listed between my two departments, the History of Art, the Program in Ethnicity, Race and Migration, as well as Environmental Studies, um, and it should be cross-listed with American Studies too. So it's quite an interdisciplinary class with a very interdisciplinary group of students as well. The two guiding questions for the course, which relate to this last point is are how does and did the visual culture of the national parks create support and narrate a particular vision of u.s national identity at his distinct historical moments and for whom are the parks and whose interests are represented through its visual culture so um the fir in the first iteration of the course, I teamed up with Pam Patterson, a wonderful colleague of TRIPS here at the Center for Teaching and Learning, and she helped me to develop a course website that I used last spring. It was a combination of course press and a uh, time map. Um, so students could map objects and they could map events, but it also was kind of a clunky platform for us and didn't actually see a larger audience outside of that course. Um, so for this iteration of the, of the project and with the help of the Rosencrantz grant, I wanted a more a robust site and one that would be more integrated into the content of the class so students wouldn't be creating um, written assignments just for me they would be creating things that would ultimately be made available here um, and to a larger public so through this process we chose to use Omeka as the platform for the project and you can sort of read more about it here it's something that has gained some currency across the humanities um, and I worked with the team not only of Pam who is really really helpful in this process talking talk to librarians around campus as well um, but I also worked with a developer Marshall Jefferson and a graphic designer Micah Barrett who helped it make look who helped it look really good because um, Omeka does not look this good right out of the box. So uh, the project is where students are actually building the collection um, as a public resource that's available to a general public as well as for other educators. It's not like this is a common class. This is one I invented. Um, it wasn't easy to sort of find these resources. Um, so I thought we could kind of build a collection together. And so for one of the assignments, students had the option of uh, of adding objects. So they were asked to add five objects um, and to kind of add the metadata that would be related to them. Um, so to give you an example, here for example the student adds an image, they use Dublin Core, um, and I'll show you that interface very briefly actually. Uh, 
Um, so here it was, you know, there's kind of an out of the box solution. There's also a way to kind of detail and give examples for students of the kinds of things that they should be adding in these different moments. The other thing it allows them to do is to map their objects. So they um, type in an, an, er an address. And uh, this one is a mountain scene, so it's an ambiguous um, area and does not show up on the map. But that was, uh, it, it allows these objects to then show up on the, on the map for the collective as well. Um, so that was sort of the first aspect of the assignment. Another thing that they did was add, these, they, these are then organized into different collections and these are organized by medium. Um, here, for example, you know, students might choose kind of more contemporary objects as well as historic ones. Some of these things are in Yale's collections, um, many others are outside. Uh, and students have written, as another assignment for the course, students were asked to write two object descriptions. And so these are the kinds of texts you might see, for example, at a, mu at a museum on the wall next to the object. Um, and they're interpreting uh, the objects through these, through these kinds of texts that they're using. Um, some of the challenges for this was, of course, consistency of object entries. So things like if they write like, uh, you know, circa 1910, it won't appear in the timeline, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, also, things like permissions and credits was something we talked about. So using things that are in fair use or that are in the public domain. Um, things that are created by the government, of course, are in the public domain. So a number of students actually got interested in things like the Instagram um, of the National Park site and have added a number of objects uh, from that as well. Okay, so I didn't really, as you can sort of see, I, um, I didn't want to privilege kind of one point of access to these objects. So we have, the, you can enter through the objects as a whole and search across them. You can search by collection, say you're only interested in photographs, you can go immediately there. Um, there's also this map feature, which is sort of maybe the most sort of spectacular <laughs> aspect, um, but it allows you to see the various objects that we've added, and it takes a minute to load generally. But you can see that we've yeah, so you can interact with this here if you're not interested in seeing the state borders, for example, if you're only or if you're not interested in architecture or photographs, it will limit your search in this in this way too. This is also um, the timeline feature, so if you're only interested in objects from a specific period of time, uh, you can see them here. And then of course, you can interact with individual objects through this platform as well. Lots of objects in Yellowstone, and that's been sort of an interesting feature of this project too, is seeing where um, many of the objects kind of tend to cluster together. will take us to another object, um, and then we can read, you can sort of learn more about uh, an object in this way as well. Um, so obviously I was thinking about, you know, this isn't just for educators, it's not just for somebody who's interested in visual art, but say you're planning a trip to Yellowstone, you could come to this resource uh, and kind of look ahead and, and see what kinds of things um, have, have resulted from this. Um, the visual culture of the National Parks is really, there's several apocryphal stories. There's one painting, for example, by Thomas Moran that was said to lead to actual legislation that led to Yellowstone being preserved. Um, so it, just to give you a sense of kind of some of the importance of these projects, but students were really adding objects that they thought should be included, um, that they were interested in. The final assignment for the course is actually for each student to create uh, a final exhibition. So they'll be adding more objects that they will need for their, for their exhibitions, um, but they're also using some of the objects that we've also, that we've already added. Here are a couple, couple of just sample ones that we've done. Um, so if you check back in a week uh, when their final assignments are due, um, you will hopefully see uh, some some of the projects that the students have done. This is a sample just to show you what it'll look like. So a kind of landing page image, um, text to contextualize it, and then bringing objects into different kind of communication with one another. Um, and they're still doing things like including uh, work cited at the end of their project so that we have kind of a academic aspect to this too. Um, but I really encourage students to kind of 
tell a story in a way through these exhibitions um, to give you some sense of what project students are working on. One is working on food. Um, so she's going to talk about bison in, in, as one of the subsections of her exhibition. She's going to talk about grazing. She also saw some menus um, in some of the collections at Yale that she was interested in. Um, and one of the questions she's also interested in is uh, the kind of rise of ethnic food at certain parks, um, depending. So like if it's a, tex a Texas National Park. Um, and a lot of this stuff is available online, um, and she's bringing them together uh, in this context. Another student is interested in selfie culture, um, so she's kind of thinking about how to tell that story um, through these artworks as well. Uh, so this is a project that I'll continue to build on and add in future iterations. Um, there's still some tweaking uh, that we want to do at this stage. Um, much, much of the Rosencrantz grant for this project went to paying the developer and the designer um, to make this kind of such a visually appealing project. Um, but I'm happy to take questions now and suggestions. So this is available for the public. Have you reached out to any of the parks themselves yeah. or to get it out there? <laughs> yeah, I think that's the next stage. So I do have contacts um, in at various national park sites. On the one hand, I like that it's independent. Um, on the other hand, I would like for it to be kind of recognized officially by the National Park Service at some stage. At this stage, also, there's about 115 objects, so it's not a very robust collection. Um, but it will continue to grow. And I, I, I do see and envision uh, the the possibility of growing. So 115, how many times have you run this? This is, through? so in the, f the right, last spring when I taught the course, students weren't adding collections. So this was kind of one of the innovations, I think, that this project um, and the Rosencrantz grant helped me to do. Um, but uh, yeah, it, they're already going to be adding more objects for their exhibitions too. Um, so it will only continue to grow as a collection. But yeah, I'd certainly like to talk more to National Park Service individuals about this. Yeah, trip. Um, what are your, I guess, expectations at this uh -huh. point for the students doing web native Omeka authentic mm -hmm. exhibits mm -hmm. as opposed to illustrated essays? And that's a loaded yeah. question because I've yeah. worked with Omeka before and I feel like that's a tough transition for students yeah. to make. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and Neatline, of course, is a plugin that we've also made available to students, and I won't get into it now, but it is kind of more robust storytelling um, environment for that. So I just I just ran into one of my students over break, and she was talking about the exhibition that she's working on now. And we, I, you know, this is the first time I've made this kind of assignment. I don't have a lot of expectations in terms of what they're doing, but I am encouraging them to think about how they interact with the web, things like um, breaking up paragraphs, adding visuals, like so that you're not just kind of constantly paging through text or so those things aren't segregated from one another. Um, but I think what this also allows is interactivity within the site. So if you're clicking on an object, it will bring you back to that object file or the object card is another way we've thought about that. Um, yeah, so I think you've done great scaffolding work to get them yeah, there yeah. by front-loading all this work with right, the objects right, and the collections. Right. So this is where we are and what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, now put it together. Yeah, and you know, people in CTL really helped me think through that. Like, there are steps of like adding the objects. I had to check kind of all the objects to make sure they were kind of consistent across that. And then things like adding the object descriptions. T typically in classes, I have students write what's called a formal analysis in art history. Um, that's an exercise in close looking. So here students wrote instead for the web platform. So we've been talking about those kinds of things. And I think it is a really useful kind of skill for them to have too. Sure. <laughs> um, and that is about the object centric. Uh -huh. I feel like I'm hearing that a lot more in humanities work these days. This this object centric. Oh know, yeah. I don't know if that's just yeah. that I'm entering into this world or if, yeah. or if that is in fact a change. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, Part of it is like it's deprivileging artwork as the as that signifier, and the course is a visual culture course. Um, Yale tends to be kind of conservative in art history, and so uh, but we are you know some of the students have added things like Patagonia hats and matchboxes as well as objects, or like the, somebody included an ad for cigarettes that has the Grand Canyon in the background. So it's it's been really cool to see the kinds of objects students are interested in. Um, but yes, I would say in the humanities as a whole, there's a big push towards object-centered research and thinking about what the object can tell you, not just what the archives can tell you. Um, is there 
any sort of approval process before it's live on yeah. the web. So I think you have the privilege of working with Yale students. Yes. So I'm sure nothing's bad. Yeah. But if something misses the mark, yeah. like how do you do quality control? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and I would love for this to kind of be publicly accessible and editable in the future, but that I think that would be the big challenge to it. Um, so for the students in this course, I checked their object description. So we went through a round of edits before they added them. Um, and that was in part so that they would feel comfortable what that, about what they had written and knowing that it was going to be made public. Um, I had to get, of course, permissions for the students to attach their names to exhibitions as well as to the objects that they've added. Um, but yeah, I think it, it is like kind of checking in with them and talking to them and providing opportunities for them to have me check things before it becomes available to a general public. Yeah. yeah. This is a, another great example of these crowdsourcing uh, kind of approaches yeah. I've seen. It's yeah. The, the Yale uh, building something other than... Yeah. Uh, I wonder if there's any re resistance or mm -hmm. any feeling of a kind of coercion, the fact that you're kind of asking or mandating your students to do this Right, work. right. Um, well, that that's a good question, and I guess I'll find out with final evaluations. <laughs> um, no, I think this. I think that I'm encouraging. It's not unusual in art history part in particular to d have an assignment as some be something like an exhibition or to write an object description, which, as I said, is very similar to a formal analysis and is just a sort of different platform. So I think... For me, what it has been, it, I had Pam come into the classroom right in our second week. It's been kind of bringing them along and talking to them and making clear that part of the project of the class is to have this public engagement beyond the classroom. Um, and we've talked a lot about, you know, what kind of writing is appropriate for a general public versus a paper that they write privately for me. Um, so I think, if anything, they've been really excited about kind of finding cool things and sharing them and adding them here. But um, it is, yeah, it could be a problem. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.